Fear. Fear is a perfectly natural and initial human response to adversity. But just beyond the doorway of adversity, we find the rooms of opportunity. Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously told us, there is nothing to fear except fear itself. And Eckhart Tolle speaks of fear to remind us, in this very moment, there is nothing to fear. We know that fear has no physical form. It does not exist outside of the mind. It is perhaps what the author Albert Murray refers to as a blue devil, a blue devil of nada. In itself, fear is not the actual problem. Our inability to deal with fear is the problem. Well, in his autobiography, Music is My Mistress, and throughout his life, Duke Ellington insisted that wherever you have problems, you have possibilities. So how do we choose from those possibilities to address one's adverse situations? Well, this perhaps is one of the most existentially important questions we can ask ourselves in this very moment. Because the answer to this question will help to determine how we choose to live our lives and how we will exist. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear one has to imagine millions of people clustered around their radio sets in towns all across the country. They don't know what to expect of this new president. He's not shown them much yet. And then they hear, coming through their loudspeakers, this voice. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly so filled with uh, courage, with self-confidence, with a sense of leadership. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Suddenly this man came in and he made clear to the country that there was really nothing to fear except the fear that was in one's own heart. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. Which the country was so excited that one had a live leader, finally, at long last, in the White House, that he could have suggested we all get ready to walk to the moon and we would have followed him. It was just an unbelievable change in mood. Upon returning to the North in approximately 1933 from a tumultuous tour, Duke Ellington and his band endured the South's adverse segregational stipulations, which the South had been enforcing over its entire fairly recently freed black population. Duke Ellington was faced with a problem a problem that prohibited him from swinging his scalding hot, democratically forged and freedom swinging jazz for the neediest members of the congregation. Basically, as a predominantly black musical orchestra, Duke could not travel or obtain lodging accommodations unimpededly through the South as he went from performance to performance. He could not use the public transportation and local accommodations simply because he and the musicians were black and the necessary public transportation and accommodations were segregated or for whites only. Now this problem was a perplexing problem, but with Duke's ingenuity and attitude toward any problem, he was soon able to come up with a solution to this adversity and he turned this problem into possibilities. Well, Duke and his band returned to the South the following year. However, they traveled in a different manner. 
The great politicians from local to state to federal, and especially the presidential political candidates, had traditionally used the trains to enter a town or a city and speak to the people of that area from the train station platform. They moved from town to town, city to city, campaigning all across this great nation. Well, the public knew the fame and popularity of a politician by seeing the number of people that gathered as the train rolled into the station at each location. Duke sought to do a similar thing of sorts. Duke was able to procure several railroad cars for the sole use of his band. There were sleeping cars and sometimes even a dining car. They traveled like this through the South for several years, avoiding some of the worst elements of racism and segregation while increasing their popularity and status. They were able to stay safely accommodated in the railroad cars when performing in any particular town or city. Now in the eyes of the people, Duke and the entire band's status were raised to that of presidential. And Duke, with his ever clever wit and wisdom, used this freedom to swing his music and the band's sounds of syncopated and harmonized democracy through the South cutting a safer path for future musicians, artists, and humanity to hear.
fact that we must choose how to meet one's individual adverse situation, despite the presence of fear, forces us as individuals to dig deep and find the foundation of our own existence, providing an opportunity to either widen or deepen that foundation. The conscious digging to widen or deepen our foundation will support the continuing and uplifting growth of the structure that an individual's existence is built upon. Now, a global adversity, however, such as this current pandemic, has ironically provided us with the opportunity to widen or deepen humanity's foundation for an awakening of a collective consciousness. Opportunity, hmm, the essence of a speech which Martin Luther King Jr. delivered to a 1967 Philadelphia Junior High School entitled, What is Your Life's Blueprint? where he addresses the issue of creating a good blueprint for your life, is in a similar way what Jesus spoke of when referring to building a deeper foundation for your home. These foundations and blueprints are not just for the homes we live in, but also for the bodies we dwell in and for the lives we as individuals live as well. Question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide, as the model for those who are to build the building. And a building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. And I want to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth and always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have, as a basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor you're going to be deciding as the days and the years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are opening to each of you that were not open to your mothers and to your fathers. And the great challenge facing you 
is to be ready to enter these doors as they open. And so I would urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. And I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley. But be the best little scrub on the side of the rill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. And finally, in your life's blueprint, must be a commitment to the eternal principles of beauty, love, and justice. Don't allow anybody to pull you so low as to make you hate them. Don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your self-respect to the point that you do not struggle for justice. However young you are, you have a responsibility to seek to make your nation a better nation in which to live. You have a responsibility to seek to make life better for everybody. And so you must be involved in the struggle for freedom and justice. Now, in this struggle for freedom and justice, there are many constructive things that we all can do and that we all must do. And so our slogan must not be, burn, baby, burn. It must be, build, baby, build. Organize, baby, organize. Yes, our slogan must be, learn, baby, learn, so that we can earn, baby, earn. <laughs> and with a powerful commitment, I believe that we can transform dark yesterdays of injustice into bright tomorrows of justice and humanity. Let us keep going toward the goal of selfhood, toward the realization of the dream of brotherhood, and toward the realization of the dream of understanding goodwill. Let nobody stop us, but we must keep moving. We must keep going. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl, but by all means, keep moving. As we create our blueprints and dig our foundations, we are reminded that we are not alone. There are our brothers and sisters who follow the same arduous process. You know, the 
essay mentions an arduous process, which is like a difficult process, right? And that reminds me of a story we read, right? Also, also it mentions brothers. And also it mentions something about being alone. And I thought, wow, this really relates to the old man in the sea that we read before. So I want to read this excerpt from it as some evidence that would maybe uh, back up some of the claims in my essay. No one should be alone in their old age, he thought, but it is unavoidable. I must remember to eat the tuna before he spoils in order to keep strong. Remember, no matter how little you want to, that you must eat him in the morning. Remember, he said to himself. During the night, two porpoises came around the boat and he could hear them rolling and blowing. He could tell the difference between the blowing noise the male made and the sighing blow of the female. Ah, they are good, he said. They play and make jokes and love one another. They are our brothers, like the flying fish. Uh, he began to pity the great fish that he had hooked. He is wonderful and strange, and who knows how old he is, he thought. Never have I had such a strong fish or one who acted so strangely. Perhaps he is too wise to jump. Oh, he could ruin me by jumping or by a wild rush. But perhaps he's been hooked many times before and he knows that this is how he should make his fight. He could not know that it is only one man against him, nor that it is an old man. <clears throat> but what a great fish he is. And what will he bring in the market if the flesh is good? He took the bait like a male and he pulls like a male and his fight has no panic in it. I wonder if he has any plans or if he is just as desperate as I am. <laughs> we all try to make plans, but the reality is, is a lot of times we're just, we just act in desperation, <laughs> right? There's another one I wanted to read. It's short. It's later in the book, right after he kills the fish, right? He's just harpooned him and he says, uh, <clears throat> the old man looked carefully in the glimpse of vision that he had. Remember his vision was getting blurry. Then he took two turns of the harpoon line around the bit and the bow and laid his head on his hands. Keep my head clear, he said against the wood of the bow. I am a tired old man, but I have killed this fish which is my brother, and now I must do the slave work. Now I must prepare the nooses and the rope to lash him alongside, he thought, even if we were two and swamped her to load him and bailed her out. This skiff would never hold him. I must prepare everything, then bring him in, lash him well, and step the mast and set for sail for home. As we create our blueprints and dig our foundations, we are reminded that we are not alone. There are our brothers and sisters who follow the same arduous process. Sometimes we dig fruitlessly with the tools of uncertainty and doubt. <laughs> they are the tools of fear. And though they be easy to dig with, their deceptive appearances they aimlessly misdirect our efforts, inevitably yielding failure, or worse, yield an infectious immobilization in one's apathetic view of the comparison of one's lot to another's. Therefore, it is important that we reach each time and time again for the shovel of truth and morality. They are the tools of opportunity and as we plunge them into the earth with purpose and direction, not simply for our individual success, we should remind ourselves of our brothers and sisters and know that we do not build alone. These tools are not easy to dig with, but they are the best tools for the job. There are many others whose safety 
and the success of their individual structure depends on the sturdiness, soundness, and success of our own. Because we build not exclusively, but rather communally, we are reminded of that which binds us together. We are reminded that we are something great, that is part of something greater, and we are a part of a sum, that which cannot be wholly counted without us. Therefore, the greatness of humanity is lessened when it does not account for each individual. Greatness is within the wholeness of our existence and the moral truth of our humanity is that we are not alone. play a piece by Duke Ellington. It's entitled Portrait of Louis Armstrong. It's from one of the late great suites of Ellington written around 1970-71, the New Orleans suite. And this is what he thought about Louis Armstrong. Thank you. 
In this moment, the great unanswered question of an individual's conscious choice to ponder is not which part in the chorus will we choose to call out. Nor should we be preoccupied with the selfish questions of will my call be answered or who will answer my call? But the greater question will not even be Will you listen for the conscious voice of humanity calling for you? As it perhaps was for Walt Whitman when he wrote, I hear America singing. Perhaps the greatest question for each individual to ponder is simply, when you hear the call, will you answer? Will you join the chorus? Will you join the chorus to work above, below, around, and in the face of adversity? Will you work to synchronize and harmonize with a greater consciousness for humanity? Or will you reel back your cowardly fear, shut up your mouth, and silence the sounds of your own opportunity? hear the world sing. As Walt Whitman continues his poem, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. Mother, father, brother, and sister sing. Listen. Listen to those harmonies and rhythms that wash away the dust, the dirt, and fear. When we can hear this, then we will all call out together. And together, not alone, we will all hear in concert the wholeness of truth. That which is beautiful for the mind's ear to be whole. A morality, a oneness, a greater sound of humanity ringing on high like a great steeple bell for future generations to hear. 
listen.